Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel, this is the Metaton speaking. The success of the video Roman Legion vs Late Medieval Army and the amount of requests I've received from you led me into making this into a series. So welcome to episode 2, Roman Legion vs Crusader Army. So, just like I said in the previous iteration of this series, for this historical speculation to make sense, both with the Roman Legion and with the Crusader army, we need to decide a specific point in time. Again, for the Romans, we are going to look at an early imperial army of the times of the Principate, 1st century AD, extremely well-trained and highly disciplined professional soldiers, post-Marian reforms, so heavy infantry using Gladius, Scutum and Pila. The legion would be most likely equipped with a mix of Lorica Hamata and Lorica Segmentata, the latter being the newest kind of armour. As for the Crusaders, the outcome of the battle will depend entirely on which Crusaders specifically we decide to choose for this battle scenario, not only for the technological gap we would have with the later Crusader armies facing the Romans, but most importantly for the level of training and professional military organisation the Crusaders would have. Again, as often is the case with military history, the term Crusader, a non-medieval Franco-Spanish hybrid of a word, is a huge umbrella term. Some dictionary definitions read as follow. A fighter in the medieval Crusades. The definition of the Cambridge Dictionary states, a Christian who fought in one of the religious wars of the 11th, 12th, 13th and 15th century, mostly against Muslims in Palestine. Now the choice of the Crusader army in question is tremendously important. It makes absolutely no sense whatsoever to make a statement such as the ones I've read in multiple forums. Namely, the Crusaders would have crushed the Romans because they were more advanced and futuristic. The Roman could wipe the floor with the Crusaders because of their discipline. It would be a draw. When we talk about belligerents whose relative military power differs significantly or whose strategy and tactics differ significantly, then we are in the face of what's called asymmetric warfare, although in this case we are speculating over a case of asymmetric engagement. However, what's interesting to say and what most people fail to realise is that being further back in time doesn't automatically mean that the Romans will be the less advanced faction in our discussion. To further illustrate this point, let's read the definition of asymmetric warfare. Asymmetric warfare it's typically a war between a standing professional army and an insurgency or resistance movement. Again, another definition states, attacks by small, simply armed groups on a nation armed with modern high-tech weaponry. The Crusades were a series of general international large-scale assaults which, as we could see, took place in different places and at different times in history. Now let's consider two Crusader armies, the People's Crusade and the Prince's Crusade. The People's Crusade is the actual first non-official crusade, led primarily by Peter the Hermit, a northern French priest together with troops of Walter Saint-Savoir. Pope Urban II, the political initiator of the first official crusade, had planned the departure of the Crusader army for the 15th of August 1096, but Peter the Hermit and his following departed earlier on their own. The Crusader army in question was made of bands of peasants and low-ranking knights. Now according to Christopher Tyerman, a historian specialising on the Crusades, Peasants' Crusade is a misnomer. It did contain fewer nobles and mounted knights than the later armies, but this army still possessed cohesion, funds and leadership. We're not talking just about a bunch of peasants, although, of course, untrained peasants were also part of it. But as he himself again states, discipline proved hard to maintain. In fact, in September, the People's Crusaders' armies were annihilated by the Turks. So, an army that lacked discipline against an army that excelled in discipline, you know where this is going. The Crusader army would not stand a chance against the much better equipped, well-trained, war-experienced, battle-hardened and highly disciplined Roman legions. The Roman legion would completely butcher the first unofficial crusader army. I've made this example of blatant Roman victory as an answer to all those who consider medieval armies to be automatically technologically superior to Roman armies without bringing in context. And as you can see, that is not always the case. For the Roman legions, the uh, People's Crusader army would have been a joke. 
Well, let's now bring a proper Crusader army to the discussion, uh, namely the First Crusades army, uh, the same army that actually managed to conquer Anatolia, to conquer the Holy Land, to establish the Kingdom of Jerusalem, the Crusader Kingdom of Jerusalem, in southern Levant. Normally, a Roman legion would be made of about five to 6,000 men. It is important to consider, however, that at the end of the civil war against Mark Antony, Augustus was left with around 50 legions. The number was subsequently reduced to 28, but even in that case, that would mean the Roman Empire had, at the time of Augustus, the ability to summon up a huge number of well-trained professional soldiers who were able to march, reach any location in the empire and fight. In the case of the medieval crusader armies, if we consider all the armies and contingents led by all the nobles, which actually included forces from the Byzantine Empire as well, a completely different political and military body to that of the Roman Empire, before anyone says it's Roman versus Romans, we could reach a number of 40,000 men with about 20% of non-combatants and a cavalry to infantry ratio of about 1 to 7. This number, however, it's comprising all the different and separate armies which joined forces at Jerusalem. So for justice sake, we shouldn't have one single Legatus Legionis, or Legion Legate, with his Roman legion face all the medieval crusader armies together. In my opinion, we should instead have a Legatus Augusti Pro Praetore, an imperial legate, the commander of two or more legions, to do so. Going back to the actual numbers of the crusader armies, this will somewhat equal 5,000 well-equipped and trained cavalry in full male armour and steel helmets, and 30,000 infantry at the beginning of the expedition. However, here is where one of the most significant differences between the first official crusader army and the Roman legions appears. Logistics. Of the estimated 5,000 knights who took part in the Prince's Crusade, only about 1,500 reached the destination of Jerusalem, along with another 12,000 healthy foot soldiers, out of perhaps as many as 30,000. Even though medieval armies tend to have higher numbers than single Roman legions taken separately from the whole Roman army, we need to consider the conditions in which these armies fought. Surely, the Crusader army was still a force not to underestimate, as they did manage to win the Muslim Caliphate and conquer Jerusalem. But numerical superiority is not a driving factor on its own. So, of the upward 100,000 soldiers who had left for Jerusalem in 1096, including everything, so including also those who had caught up with them during the following three years, perhaps no more than 14,000 reached Jerusalem in June 1099. I'd like to underline that the information I take from Christopher Tierman's book, The Crusades, was also commended by Professor Malcolm Barber, University of Reading. This is very important because, as I said, although generally speaking, medieval logistics was also good, in this specific case of the first official crusader army, it wasn't at all. And having the Roman face the crusader army in the very same conditions in which it still managed to take Jerusalem would be an interesting scenario. We could have the Romans move their legions from Italia to Jerusalem, and history guarantee they would reach it fully fed and operational. If this were the case scenario, I would give an advantage to the Romans in a pitched battle against the high medieval crusaders. Sure, the medieval armour, male, their helmets would have been superior and more protective, but the morale and high tactical organisation of the Romans would bring them an advantage, in my opinion. Heavy shock cavalry would probably be the only real problem for the Romans and the one definite advantage of the crusaders. I think in having to face high medieval cavalry charges, the Romans would probably ditch trenches, prepare palisades, let's remember they excelled at construction works, or they might as well bring back the former Hastati and face the cavalry with shield and spear elite troops. The Roman legion was fluid and well capable of changing and adapting to their enemies and their weaponry and tactics, so clearly the high medieval cavalry would be superior to the Roman light cavalry, the equites, no questions asked. So much will depend on how the generals will use their troops, the weather, the terrain and lots of other situations. But in the case of a crusader army with full numbers facing the Romans, both being healthy and well fed, so before any marching or significant mobilization, then and only then I would shift the balance of this postulation and give an advantage to the Crusader army based on the fact the Romans would still probably struggle to adapt to the very efficient high medieval cavalry charges. So would that mean that the rested medieval Crusader would definitely win? 
No, it only means they would have an advantage, but the outcome of the battle would be very difficult to predict. That is because although medieval cavalry is superior and their weapons and armour would be again superior, still Roman weaponry and armour would be suitable for the task and far from being obsolete. It would be less efficient, but remember all Roman soldiers would be well equipped. Unfortunately, we couldn't say the same of all medieval crusaders. As I have said in previous videos, superior tech only doesn't guarantee victory if the gap between two warring states isn't wide enough. Clearly, mechanized warfare or airborne warfare versus the Roman legions would be a complete massacre, but high medieval armies don't have that massive technological gap. We know several Roman defeats against cavalry-based enemies, such as the defeat against the uh, Sarmatian cataphracts in Pannonia in the late 1st century, or the defeat against the Persian horsemen. And people normally tend to bring these up whenever we talk about Romans facing a cavalry-based enemy. Now, I am and I will talk about how important it is and the effectiveness of heavy shock cavalry. Yes, Rome had several defeats against these people, but we also need to remember that, Ro that the Romans eventually managed to penetrate Persia and sacked the capital. Sure, medieval male would have been more protective and it would have covered more, but we need to understand that even though military power as conventionally understood does conduce to victory, we need to remember that much depends on the gap between the two factions, and in my opinion, the gap between the Imperial Roman legions and the High Medieval armies is not large enough to bring to a result of total, unquestionable annihilation of the Romans. Alright, number ones, well I hope that you enjoyed this video. If it is, please remember thumbs up and subscribe to my channel for more content from the Metatron. And please let me know, for the third iteration of this series, who would you like to see? Would you like to see Romans versus Mongolians? Would you like to see ancient Chinese armies versus medieval armies? Or do you want to see Romans facing heathen armies from, for example, the Vikings, although the Romans were heathen themselves at the time? Anyways, let me know who would you like me to talk about in the next iteration of this series. And remember, the Metatron has spread his wings. Goodbye.